Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure for us to have Father Dr. Sunny Joseph, Professor, Department of Education, St. Joseph University, Timapur, who is going to speak on the topic, 21st Century Classroom and Students, a Constructivist Approach to Education. So I request all the participants to kindly pay attention and listen to this lecture series, since the topic is very relevant to present day classroom situation. I hope and believe that we will all learn something from him. So, sir, you may take your time now. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I am grateful to all of you, especially to Ms. Yarmola and to Ms. Rosling, who have invited me to this program. I am grateful to the principal and the management of the college and all of you, the members, the faculty, and the students of the department. I'd like to make a little presentation on the 21st century classroom and students, a constructive approach to education. So now I shall have a small uh, content of the program like this. I am sure you can see the screen. So the topic, as it is said, is 21st century classroom and students, a constructivist approach to education. The content of today's talk is this introduction and the characteristics skills of the future, origin of constructivism, and development of the concept and practice of constructivism, and constructivism and classroom, then a critical perspective, negative as well as the benefits, then skill development for tomorrow and conclusion in question hour. That is the plan of the day. So now I like to request all of you especially the students, to have a pencil and pen and then note down some questions that come to your mind about this topic, about the 21st century classroom, students, and the constructivist approach to education like that. Or generally about constructivism. So we have basically a three components of the topic. One is the 21st century classroom, then the 21st century students, then the approach to education as a philosophy of constructivism. So you can write anything about that, and then we can share it. Uh, during the discourse, during our discussions. So you may have so many questions that come to your mind ever since you heard of this topic. You may have already read something or you discussed with someone something about it. And then you also have had read about it or you must have already known as a part of your studies, something or the other. So now let us see what are the components of the first area of the topic, that is students of the 21st century. So you are all students of the 21st century. Sometimes you are called the millennials. That means persons who are born towards the end of 1990 and then who are born in the beginning of 2000. So this time of your life is with a lot of hope as well as with a lot of experiences of transition from all front. 
So let us see what are the characteristics of the students or young people of the time. So first of all, you all have large dreams. You can say that I have a big dream ahead of us. We are all people who are able to dream big. And then we are all able to build that dream large and then life too large. So we can visualize a life that is beyond our present expectation. That is most important characteristic of the persons like you today. I'm sure all of you have a dream. And then second one is the energy. All of us are vibrant, full of energy, enthusiastic, and creative. You know, it becomes very difficult for a person of graduate level to sit quietly and then reflect. But it is always easy for anyone of that level of studies uh, to be actively involved in doing things and then, in fact, expressing oneself. So this shows that a person has a lot of energy stored within him or within her and he or she can definitely express it in a creative way, in a positive manner or for something that is protective beyond the expectation of others. Then the third one is the competence or the capability we say. Sometimes you have heard of persons making remarks that young people are not competent enough, they are not skilled enough. But if the fact is that the competency that you have for students of graduate level or classrooms of the today are not of the competency of the traditional mindset, but of a different ability. Because the focus is more on exploration, focus is more on inquiry than simple reception, passive reception. Then the fourth one is adventurous, both thinking as well as in doing. We can be adventurous in our thinking, we can be adventurous in our doing too. And that becomes part and parcel of our behavior. We act adventurously. We have it to sometimes remain greatly cautious about the effect of such kind of an adventurous activity too. But normally it is found that persons who are adventurous are adventurous for the sake of being adventurous and also for getting the thrill of that. And it is very important that we have it definitely in our life too. So the next one is decision. We can make instant decisions just as we make instant coffee or instant food. There is no call of the past to make a decision. What is convenient, what is feasible is made as a decision. So that is in fact a strength of the present generation of students, especially in the colleges or even higher secondary too. Then the next one is industriousness. The students are industrious. They are very hard working. They give a work to the students or give a task to the students. We find them giving the maximum of commitment and energy to that and fulfilling it to the best of their ability before the scheduled time. They have an experience of uh, Students who are giving the assignments much ahead of time, saying that we let it complete it and then be free. Or complete a series of assignments or work or tasks that are given 
and then we want to have the sense of achievement. Then the next one is a speed. All of us have that sense of speed. That is whether it is for communication or whether it is for uh, getting things done. We want to do things fast and fast. The greater the speed, the greater the satisfaction. Just as the 3G has disappeared, the 4G has come, and then the 5G too is in the offing. And that is actually reflected in our behavior too, in our achievement, in our progression too. So everywhere we have uh, these characteristics as part of the behavior of young people or students in the colleges. I am sure you will find all these in your own classroom too, in your own personal behavior too. You all have dreams, you have big energy, you have the ability to do things, you dare to do things, you are adventurous, you are able to make a decision about your life, about things being done, and you are able to remain industrious, continuously working hard and the speed by which you are able to perform things. And all these come together and then you have a sense of achievement. Achievement motivation becomes very strong for you. And that is what makes the students perform better and better in general. And then apart from these, general characteristics of the students of the classroom, let us see what are the top skills that are required for the future. So these top skills are actually from the conventions that are performed, convened by the United Nations. They have predicted the skills that are required for future generations to come. So how we are, going to have these characteristics of the present uh, students of the colleges and then how are they going to make use of them in the near future, maybe after three or five years or after two years or after one year when we are in the field in search of a job or when we are wanting to make a life of their own. First one is complex problem solving. See, all the problems appear to be simple, but all problems cannot be solved simply or cannot solve all the problems. So complex problems solving skill is a challenge for the future. And so we are expected to develop that. Just as a person is able to make a fast decision today, a person is expected to assess the complexity of problems in the future and are able to solve that. That is the challenge that a person is going to have. A simple problem can be solved by analyzing the pros and cons or uh, positives and negatives, but in future it will be a web of complexities wherein one solution that is suggested can always adversely affect the other. And so there has to be more and more facts or skills to solve problems that will be emerging as complex. Now for that, what is the next quality that is required? That is critical thinking. See, we are able to make adventurous enterprises now, but that is not always with real assessment of the result or program. In the future, to be successful, a person needs to be having this skill of critical thinking. 
We call it in different ways. We call sometimes this critical thinking as ability to debate. Some people say it is divergent thinking. But basically it is an approach to a situation uh, that can create people have different abilities to assess same thing in different ways. Uh, for example, you take a coin with you. People all normally say that a coin has both sides, two sides. But what about the side that on which you can hold the coin? There is a third side to it, the brim of it. What about that? We are able to assess it beyond the phenomenology or beyond the language that we are using. We are able to approach a situation. And we are not able to limit our thought to what we hear or what we are able to express through our language. So that is why we are expected to have uh, this great gift of critical thinking. So the next one is creativity. So no problem can be solved without a creative approach to that. A person who is more intelligent, a person who is able to assess situations in a different way, is able to remain more and more creative too in his or her own life. So it is very important that the youngsters for the future are inculcating this skill of being creative. And it is an innate, innate quality that also can be developed through continuous nourishment, just like intelligence. So the next one is people management. How do we manage people? We can manage things, we can manage time, we can manage your studies, we can manage a lesson, we can manage uh, animals or pets. But how to deal with the people, how to manage people, this can become a challenge for the future. And it is in fact a challenge. That is why we can find in different societies, people are getting secluded. They even deny life with the family for different reasons. They prefer to live alone, so as to say, leaving the communities away. It becomes a challenge for us all to face a situation of social life, managing people as persons. So the next one is coordination with others. I'm sure you all enjoy a teamwork, to be a member of a football team or basketball team, or in a club, NCC, or any other uh, clubs of your college or of the community or associations. So coordinating with others to do one's own task is in fact a challenge. And this is a gift or and the skill that is to be developed for the future. Otherwise, the real leadership skills will not be available for the future. They have already experienced that in certain countries. The problem is not that People are not ready to lead, but we do not have people with leadership abilities to coordinate people and go along with the rest of the society. And the next one is judgment and decision making. We are able to make instant judgments, just like instant decisions. Now, but the days to come, information will be instant. Now, 
to it is but making a judgment on that information or making an analysis of that information and then going ahead to have a decision is going to be a challenge because the instant information that is available can be rooted away from reality can be rooted away from truth can be rooted away from anything that is oriented towards positive welfare so this can be a challenge for us or to inculcate then the next one is service orientation we all have enterprises we all have different ideas about life but searching people who are able to serve others with a sense of sacrifice is the need of the hour all of us can work for profit all of us need to work for benefit at the same time an altruistic ability has to be developed because altruism or service orientation is one of the most important ingredients of social coexistence if that is not there we are not able to live in harmony with others then negotiation what does this mean negotiation is actually done normally in the context of a conflict that is the general understanding but in every context every situation we have this negotiation of things for example in the classroom is tell you negotiate with your friends for space to sit or to walk and go out of the class or enter the class in line or according to the space through the door you wait for the next for standing in queue these are all simple skills of negotiation that we practice for our future so that we can have not only through our behavior but also through our cognitive way this negotiation with others in an interview what happens it is this negotiation that happens you are negotiating you are producing your knowledge and assessing yourself an examination of what does it happen it is this negotiation you are doing and you are receiving a feedback a response then the cognitive flexibility that is done cognitive level is always referring to the intelligence of a person so when we speak about the flexibility of this cognitive level of a person we normally understand the absence of stubbornness of a person but it is not that alone it is the ability to adapt absorb different ideas and then to have an eclectic approach to its life and principles we are able to have different views observed for our own decision making process and then have a comprehensive or a holistic view so these are the 10 skills that are required for future so what are we doing in order to develop all these and also to nourish those positive qualities or characteristics that we have seen in the among the students of the classroom of the day most important philosophy that we can follow is this constructivism as a means for developing such skills so now let us see what is this constructivism 
The constructivism is actually a philosophy of inquiry. So we can consider its origin uh, from the time of Socrates, of ancient philosophers of Athens, have this system of dialogue, questioning and answering. And this system always brought people to pose correct questions, to elicit reflective answers. So when a person is asked something, he or she cannot spontaneously answer if he or she is not prepared to have that answer. So the purpose of Sajid Kindi of a method, it was known as Socratic dialogue, was to ask a question so that the student or the disciple or the follower or a respondent could answer after reflection. So this reflection was a time that was meant for assessing one's own thought. That is originality. But as it developed, you know, the modern psychologists as well as philosophers gave a different view to that and practices were attached to that in the classroom level. And that is basically done by Jean Piaget, who brought about the theory of cognitive development. So what did he say? He said that we can learn or human beings can learn through the construction of progressively complex logical structures that begins from infancy to adulthood. That means we learn by absorbing different concepts or structures and we build on that. That is what he says. So now, in, when it is introduced in the field of education, he interpreted it as a system that helps a person to have knowledge built successively on what is already built. That means a person is able to increase the knowledge in depth of that area and also in the complexity of that area from one stage to the next stage. So these two are important, the depth of knowledge and the complexity of knowledge. And then you are able to understand John Dewey. He con considered education to be grounded in real experience. Some people consider that as a pragmatism like that. But he also has this constructivism in his thinking. When he said, if we have doubts about how learning happens, engage in sustained inquiry. That means study, ponder, consider alternative possibilities and arrive at your belief grounded in evidence. So we can interpret it as an experimental learning, but it is understood from the perspective of constructivism because Enquiry is the key to constructivist learning. So he says, we have to first of all go on searching for knowledge. Enquiry. That means a person's character has to be continuously built on inquisitiveness. When we have Lev Vygotsky, he you know, is about the social learning theories. And he considers that at every developmental level, a person can progress from one level of knowledge 
to the next level of knowledge with the greater ability to solve problems beyond that level. If there is guidance and collaboration with others. That means a person can surprise others with his or her performance, with his or her ability. If he or she is guided by others or by the peers. So that is because of the ability to grow from one ability with, to the other with the backing of the same ability. Then we have Jerome Brunner. He speaks about the four significant aspects of effective teaching and learning. He says that attitude towards learning, knowledge presented in a way that accommodates the student's learning, then the material that is presented and the matter that is considered carefully for reward or punishment. He uses another term for reinforcement too. So these are the things that Yeram Rona says and he considers constructivism as most effective means for presenting the knowledge one has already acquired. Now let us see what David Osabel would say. He says that learning is taking place through an interaction between new materials and relevant materials that are prior to the knowledge that he or she has or attempted to acquire. So that will lead a person to have cognitive structures in his life. The person can always learn because he is able to have an interaction between the knowledge that he is attempting to acquire and has already acquired. And that is possible because the curriculum that is prepared is appropriate to the development of a person's cognitive abilities. Then there is Seymour Puppert and he brought a different concept of uh, constructivism and told about the use of technology in, in the environment of classroom for development of learning. And that is why we have the use of technology in our education, especially in the field of learning things that are difficult. Then John B. Bransford changed this concept of constructivism from a theory into practice by the use of technology. And this is actually the transformation period. It was remaining as a theory that is bereft of technology, but Brian's Ford brought in the use of technology and he said that constructivism can be more protective with the use of technology, especially information and communication technology. Then Ernst von Glasserfeld spoke about the radical constructivism and this is related to the knowledge that a person is acquiring. He spoke about the experiences that a person has that can lead to acquisition of knowledge. And if the experience is giving him knowledge, as experience is subjective, the knowledge that a person is acquiring also can be subjective. That is what he says. So that is possible because Every person who is producing something more for that person's life as a knowledge, uh, he will always find it easy to construct it according to his own perspective. 
So now, let us skip this two and let's see what is this constructivism in the present life. See, constructivism is a theory of how people learn. We can say that there are two foundations of that. One is observation and another one is scientific study. So if I ask you, how do you learn? You will have so many uh, things to say. You will learn by reading, you will learn by disc learn through discussion, you will learn through writing, you will learn by memorizing, you learn by understanding, or you learn by analyzing, or you also learn by making questions out of what you learn. And there are different ways you can learn. So constructivism is considered to be a theory about how people learn. They has got two foundations, observation and scientific study. So it continues to be considered how people are able to construct their own understanding and knowledge of the self, of the world, and of everything through experiencing things and reflecting on those experiences. So that is the beauty of it. We can construct our own knowledge. We can develop our own understanding and knowledgeability about the world, about things around, and about the self too by experiencing it and reflecting on those experiences. You see, I am sure you all have uh, practiced some note-taking. In the class, you take the running notes, then most of you go back home in the evenings and sit down and then take the running notes to the classes and write the proper notes and prepare the notebook for you to refer up to it for examinations. That's what Excel is being done. So first we have an experience or listening to the teacher or asking some questions. So we note down there. And then afterwards when we go back home, we take the running notes and then take another book and then give structure to that, give fresh to that, explanations and write according to the paragraph, according to the points, and then make an essay of that. That is how we construct knowledge. So when one encounters something new, one has to reconcile it to one's previous ideas and experiences. See, how do we say that I have come across something new? What is new actually? We say that there is something new only when we have not come across that. And we are able to know that more and more. We can do that by changing what one believes and discarding the new information as irrelevant. That is how we are able to cope with that. So we are able to remain active in creating one's own knowledge. And for that we have to ask questions, we have to continuously be inquiring things. Then we have construction, constructivism and classroom. So what is a classroom according to this constructivism? That is what we are saying. The students are the focus of the classroom, not the teachers. So the concept of a student who is a passive recipient of the information given by the teacher is no more existing. The student is actively involved in the process of learning and the students are to learn and if they are not able to learn, then definitely they are 
are not able to find what is relevant for their life too. So what is the role of a teacher? Teacher is a facilitator. The teacher, he or she can facilitate the learning by coaching, by mediating, by prompting, by helping the students to develop and assess their own understanding and thereby their learning too. So what happens here is the student need not be dependent fully on the teacher to learn. That's all. So the largest or the biggest responsibility of a teacher is to help the students to ask good questions. Good questions. People can ask questions, but they may not be questions that are considered to be good. We can ask questions at a different level. We can ask questions from meaning, from concept, from exploration, from analysis, etc. So for this, we need to have a concept of what knowledge is. So the teacher and the student need to consider knowledge not as an inert factoid or a fact that is to be memorized. No. Knowledge is to be considered as something dynamic. It is our changing view of the world, we are living, and also it is related to the ability of a person to be successfully stretching out and exploring the views that we have. So knowledge is not something that is related only to the memory, to be stored in the memory, but it is to be lived out because it is dynamic, it is vibrant, it is to be helping a person to have a greater world view. The materials are primarily test books and workbooks. So in our situation with college, we do not have uh, this problem of having test books. We have reference books. And then we are expected to have materials that include primary sources of materials and manipulative materials. In a constructive waste classroom, we have the materials that are included for manipulating the materials. In the traditional classroom, learning was based on repetition. But in the present classroom, learning becomes interactive, it is based on the other and the student already knows what is to be learned. Then the curriculum began with the part of the whole, it emphasized basic skills, but now it emphasizes on the big concepts. Early it was adhering to fixed curriculum that was greatly valued in the classroom, for example, but now it is on the pursuit of uh, questions and the interest of the students who are uh, learning different things. So the teachers are expected to disseminate information to students. That was the old system, but now the teachers are having dialogue with the students. Early the teachers were directing the students, but now the teacher is able to negotiate and direct the in dialogue of the students. Early the assessment or evaluation was through testing, but now it is through the works of the students that are observed according to the point of view of the students themselves. Now, the knowledge was seen as inert in the old system, but in the constructivism, it is dynamic and is ever changing and students work primarily in the groups for that. 
So now, what are the learning activities that the students can have? They can formulate their own questions. Students can formulate their own questions. That's what I had asked you to do at the beginning itself. Then there can be multiple interpretations of those expressions of learning. We have multiple intelligence. I'm sure you have studied that. And encourage group work. We have said that we are expect to have the teacher quality of people management. That is through collaborative learning. We can have it. And that is to be considered for students not to become people who can lead learning processes. So students reflect on and talk about their own activities. And students can control their own learning process. It's not the teacher who is controlling, but it is the student themselves. They become experts of their own learning processes. If you have seen, there are people who are writing journals. Every one of us can do that. Journal writing is bringing knowledge to the reflective level. And we have the collaboration among others, among the students themselves, that it can contribute to learning. First of all, learning is not emerging from an individual experience alone. It emerges from collective experience. As a result, if we have a teamwork, then the learning effectiveness will be a greater. So they are able to explore things and they are also able to see what is greater. So a classroom has to be more and more interactive. The classroom has to be greatly sharing ideas. They are able to use their inquiry methods to ask questions, investigate a topic, and use the variety of resources to find solutions for answers. They are also able to draw conclusions. The students are able to explore, and that exploration is able to continue con without stopping after one topic or two topics. And every question leads to another question. Then one negative aspect of it, it is, some people criticize it as saying that it is an elitist philosophy. But it is not a philosophy that is meant only for the upper class or the schools or institutions that have the best of the art facilities but it can be implemented in a simple way in every institution. So the benefits, what are the benefits? All of us can learn more and more and enjoy learning more when we are actively involved. I'm sure I have written here children. Children are learning more and more when they enjoy learning. Similarly, all of us, young and adult, we we'll learn more, retain more when we are enjoying it. So when we are working towards acquisition of knowledge, we are thinking and understanding more than memorizing. So constructivism concentrates on learning how to think and understand. That is actually the most important benefit of constructivism. So learning is definitely helping the students to organize their own principles of life. That is how an individual philosophies are framed. It gives the students the ownership of what you learn. Learning is based on the questions that the students pose and they also design the assessments of the students as well. They can always retain and transfer the knowledge to real life situations 
whatever may be, real life situations are different from the ideal classrooms. So in fact, these real life situations are to be lived in the classrooms and then this experience of the classroom has to be brought into real life situations for the expected transformation. Then it also is able to promote social communication skills that is created in the classroom. And then what are the skills that can be developed for our future? Thinking skills. I was telling you in the beginning about critical thinking and then we are able to develop communication and social skills because we are not learning alone, we are learning together. Then we also encourage alternative methods of assessment. It's not only right written examinations, there are different ways of uh, evaluating the students. The students are able to transfer not only knowledge but the skills to the real world. And it always encourages intrinsic motivation to learn. A person is able to learn well. At the end, I have to say that it is going to validate students' point of view. So when you, as a student, you have a view, it is considered to be valid. In conclusion, I would like to say, constructivism is a process of equipping people for the future. You will be always equipped for the uh, future as a person who has got greater ideas of life. So that's what I like to say. Thank you. And any questions? Yes, if there are any questions from the participants, you can ask now. Uh, excuse me, sir. Um, yes. Um, I have a question. Um, how does how does constructivism impact on student development? Uh, how does it impact development of a yes, student? Sir. Yes, sir, uh, yes, sir. So, yeah, that is what we have discussed actually. We have said that different areas of development are there, right? The cognitive development, physical development, social development, like that or we, we have said about multiple intelligence in one way. So when you are in the classroom, you are asking a question. So when you ask a question, that can be from your emotional perspective, it also can be from aesthetic perspective, it can be from your intelligence or cognitive perspective. So that will definitely bring an answer to that area of life. Suppose you are asking me a question, how does it help you to develop? So it is develop, helping you to develop in all the areas of life. Uh, it can be of intelligence, for example, you are asking what is constructivism? It is from the basic concept. So you are able to learn something more about what constructivism is. That will develop your cognitive area. So how does constructivism help me to interact with others? That will be helping you to have your social skills to be developed. In that way, different areas can be developed. Is that okay? Uh, oh, yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Sir, yes. I have questions that, uh, can you please tell me that what types of activities are done in constructivities classroom? Oh, yes, I mentioned some type of activities. Now, one of the most important activity is a discussion. Discussion is the most fruitful 
activity that we can have when you are able to interact with one another and share your experiences share your knowledge and share your views your views cannot be always in knowledge it can be your expectation too so that it will be shared with others and then they to bring about a common sharing and an eclectic or so to say a consensus opinion is emerging and that becomes the most important takeaway for you from a classroom and for that the teacher is present teacher becomes an animator or a facilitator for you and then second thing i have mentioned to you about uh, journal writing that is done individually by you about what you have learned in the classroom so that can be done individually as an individual activity that you take away from the class for your personal development but as an activity that you can get everyone involved with the discussion give any topic that can be a problem solving that can be an exploration or that it can be a discussion on a concept you can also uh, discuss maybe another day about what are things that we can learn to do in the classroom about constructivism as a learning theory like that is that okay okay sir okay thank you thank you Good evening, sir. Yes, uh, sir. I have a question to ask. Um, what does the constructivist approach to education mainly focuses on? It focuses on the development of the student. If the focus is the development of the student, so basically the productivity of the student has to be has to be optimized, right? The education is aiming at the optimization of the abilities of the student and that is done through gradual development so the focus of constructivism is the development of the abilities of the student to the maximum so that he or she can be developing to the full that means he or she becomes a self actualized person or self reliant person okay thank you sir yes thank okay, you sir there is one question in the chat box by kaigin jekuki so why 21st century skills are so important and when did classroom learning start oh. okay uh, this is a um, question why 21st century skills are so important this 21st century skills are actually globally prepared for the students of the present century by the international agency called united nations so that students can be prepared for a globalized world we are no more living in isolated locations we are living in a mutually affected as well as in, uh, influenced society however distant we are we are living together as one world there is a saying that humanity is one the world is one it is actually nowadays people say that is a one village the world is a village we see that so the world has become so closely linked with one another because of the communication because of the technology because of the ability to people to reach out to others because of the availability of information at the same time because of the need of people to see common welfare 
See, the pandemic itself is an example, right? Pandemic of the COVID itself is an example. How fast it has reached every nook and corner of the world. There is no nation that is not affected. There is no village that is not affected. Everywhere there is a possibility of a catastrophe. So th that is why we need to have this uh, skill. So now the second part of the question is, when did the classroom teaching start? Say the classrooms or school started as a result of the industrial revolution. So now the first school as such was started in monasteries to learn the scriptures. Whether it is uh, Buddhist or whether it is uh, any other religion, I think gradually it is a person called Joseph Kalasans uh, who started organized schooling in Europe. Basically, it is in uh, Italy. Okay. Any other question? Any more questions? No, if you have no question, could you read some questions I requested you to write? I hope some of you must have written some interesting questions. If there are no questions, then ma'am, Anik, you can take your time now. Yes. Am I eligible? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, sir, for a highly inspiring time with us. We are deeply grateful for being with us, despite of your busy schedule. It was indeed a great privilege and honor for us in reaching us with the knowledge and wisdom more details about the role of students in constructivist classroom. Thank you, sir, once again. Secondly, um, the Department of Education want to thank all the participants, students and teaching faculties who are a part of this webinar. Thirdly, the management of St. John College for permitting the Education Department to organize this program Lastly, but not the least, our almighty God, helping and guiding us for making this program a great success. Once again, thank you to all of you. I do personally thank you for giving me this opportunity and wish you all the best. Let us all keep in touch. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.